Hello, everybody. I want to thank you for, for joining us today for this conversation on tasting, rating, and sensory. John with Esther, I'd like to especially thank you because I believe you are the motivation for this conversation. We went back and forth through so many email threads over the past probably six months or so, trying to find ways to just have conversations about the unique things that you're doing. That You had me thinking, what would be a really fun time, but more to put just people who all appreciate the tasting beer experience, but have different viewpoints on how to get to the final result in the same room together and not necessarily have a debate about the different approaches to enjoying beer, but more so a conversation to see where we agree, how we can learn from one another, and more so how we can better educate ourselves and the consumers about the best ways to appreciate the beverage we all love so much. So I'm very much looking forward to this conversation over the next hour. John, thank you again for the inspiration for today. But what we're going to do to start is just brief introductions. Jacob, if you're to the right of me, if you could simply just tell everybody who you are and why this topic's important to you. Yeah, hey, good morning. Uh, my name is Jacob Hoover, and I work for White Labs here in San Diego. I'm the education experience supervisor. So um, I work in our education department, and part of my job is to manage our uh, San Diego tap room. Um, we have a White Labs Brewing Co. It's just a little offshoot where we're brewing beer for our two locations in Asheville and San Diego. And, um, you know, we love welcoming everyone visiting and all our local customers to, to taste our products, to taste uh, yeast side by side in, in the same base wort recipe. So uh, a lot of tasting and, and um, fun going on there. And then also I work on the, the education side of, of things for the for White Labs and Inc. So um, a lot of yeast focused uh, education and classes and things like that. And Jacob, I'm absolutely waiting until you can deliver to Virginia so I can look at and try side by side so many of those neat projects you're putting out there. Yeah, hopefully soon. Cool. Well, thanks for being here. Thanks for joining last minute. John with Untapped, welcome. It's nice to be more than pin pals and to see you face to face today. Very much likewise, uh, Andrew. We've uh, we've been communicating back and forth for I don't know what time is anymore, but for a long bit. Um, I do. I've worked at Untapped for a long time, and uh, more recently, I'm focusing on the Untapped podcast, which is called Drinking Socially. If you haven't listened yet, half of it is me. Um, so hopefully, the other half is good. I uh, having been at Untapped for so long, I think. Every Christmas, every Thanksgiving, every Facebook interaction, there's always somebody talking about Untapped's role and rating beers and what's the best way to do it. So it's a topic that I don't have any good answers for, but I've had a lot of discussions about, and I'm really excited to talk about it with uh, with the five of you. And dare I say, you're the most controversial panelist on the show today. You know, ratings, unique role in the state of craft beer, very important. I'm excited to have your unique perspective today. Now, Jean with Esther, it's always a pleasure to see you. And I have to say, I cut my hair about a week ago. I grow my hair very, very long, and I donated it to Wigs for Kids, an organization that donates to kids with cancer. And just looking at you really makes me miss my hair right now. I gotta, I'm not gonna <laughs> lie. But I do have to say, when you decide to let yours grow a little bit longer and cut it, I'm daring you to donate it as well. Oh, totally, yeah. I, I actually just got a haircut a couple of weeks ago. So this is, this is me with short hair. Uh, I had a ponytail a couple of months ago. Um, so, so happy to be here, Andrew, and, and thanks for organizing this. Um, so my name is Jean. I'm uh, the CEO and co-founder of Esther. I'm a food scientist, uh, born and raised in Belgium, moved to New York City uh, about four years ago, um, and started Esther after, you know, spending a lot of time in grocery retail. I used to work for a grocery retailer in, in, out in Belgium. Um, and, and one of the key reasons for me to start a company um, was that I saw that uh, there is so much data available about uh, taste and flavor and flavor preference and how people and consumers experience uh, food products. Uh, but that data is super scattered, in my opinion. Uh, it lives a little bit oh, everywhere, and, and there's no way uh, yet to get the best insights out of that data. And so we set out with Esther on a mission to kind of bring that data together and, and get better insights out of it using technology and AI. It's always fascinating to learn and hear more about what you do. So thanks for joining us again today. You're welcome. Laura, last but not least, and it's always a pleasure to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thinking about today's topic, I was taken all the way back to the 90s when I did beer festivals with my brother as a distributor. 
And so the, the tasting and the setting up of the tasting and the setting of um, talking with the consumer as they experience product has, has been with me for a very long time. And it's interesting the, um, the depth and breadth of that and how that has changed in the industry, uh, sometimes not so much and sometimes a great deal, um, to talk about where we've come with that. And I think that um, some of the, the really high-end brewers retreats that I facilitated, the big beers festival seminars, um, talking about tasting placemats, talking about places to take notes, talking about food pairings, um, really facilitating an opportunity, for example, in the, in the um, destination resort retail programs that I've created to, to teach the staff and to set up opportunities for the guests where we're not just um, giving them a safe place to adventure more about themselves, but also to learn um, what foods go together and how to suggest them together. And I think that this will dovetail very nicely with what Jacob's doing and with what John is doing in terms of that uh, piece of, of people learning what they like, but then how that directs their purchases and how that then reflects back to the brewer. No, absolutely. Now, I like to begin with a pretty personal question. Jacob, what did you have for breakfast today? I just woke up about 30 minutes ago, so I have not eaten. I got some coffee, though, so we're good there. There we go. John, what about you? I what live happened, in John? North Carolina, so I had uh, sausage and biscuits. Really and nothing John? to do with North Carolina. I just love them. <laughs> John, what about you? Have you had any yeah. breakfast yet? Uh, yes, I had my uh, daily oatmeal with fruits. Oatmeal. And Laura, how about you? Anything to eat? I was on Jacob's timeline. I worked until two o'clock in the morning and I have not experimented with my yogurt and granola yet. So it sounds like I, I had a bagel this morning. It sounds like all of us have had something different for breakfast. I think that probably speaks to the fact that we all have different preferences of what we enjoy, which really goes hand in hand with how we enjoy beer. Because I'm sure the, the five of us all probably have a different favorite style of beer, different favorite beer. We all experience a little bit different experience when we're enjoying a beverage. What I'd like to do now is to go in a circle once more and to hear the process each of you go through when you're first one deciding what beer to drink and the process you take when you drink it. Like, you know, John with Untap, for example, you know, I love to hear where the rating portion plays into effect of when you're gonna decide what beer to crack and how you're gonna enjoy it. And, you know, it, let's start with you, Jacob, at White Labs. You know, when you're deciding to, to have a beverage, why are you picking that specific beer? And what's the process like when you first enjoy it? Yeah, so f fortunately, I, I, pr I don't have a, least favorite style I, I enjoy most beer styles most most flavors and aromas that come from beer uh, i would say the most influential thing when i choose what i want to drink is is um the environment around me um you know the time of day things like that so it's very uh it's it's very based on you know am i going to have more than one or is it you know is it cold outside is it warm outside things like that um you know most of the time i want to i want to enjoy a beer or two so i'm looking at something lower ABV, um, maybe not as strong in flavor and aroma. I, I, I love German lagers and something that's just very drinkable. So um, that's probably my, my main thing is the environment. And when you're ready to approach that beer, are you going to take a whiff of the aroma first? What's your process like when you're going to enjoy it? Yeah, I mean, most time, uh, you know, we, there's definitely a difference between tasting and drinking, and I'm not always – attempting to taste a, a beer. Sometimes I just want to drink it and not really think about it. But at the same time, I like, <laughs> I like getting pretty nerdy with beer. And even for my own sake of just like training and making sure that I can still smell what I think I'm smelling, I, I do usually take a big whiff and, and try to uh, do a short analysis of, of what's in there and what's going on. Um, but not always. <laughs> If you had to guess, what percent of the time are you simply drinking a beer first going through that analysis? Uh, you know, I mean, every day we're at work, we're tasting um, a lot. Uh, you know, whether it's for panel, whether it's for beer quality, whether it's for trying out, you know, a new strain comes out in a new in a new style. Uh, so I, for me personally, I, I'm tasting a lot more. Um, the only time I'm really drinking is if I have that after work beer at night or uh, on the weekends with a friend at, at a brewery or something like that. So maybe I would say 50-50, um, but yeah, 
Awesome. Thanks for sharing. And John with Untapped, you say they call you Dr. Joe sometimes. So Dr. Joe, you know, what's your process like when you're going to select and enjoy a beverage? I, I, I'm, I'm going to pull threads from what Jacob kind of said. And that a lot of it, my first thought is, what am I going to be doing? Am I staying on the couch? Great. Barley wine's workable. Am I mowing the lawn? Maybe, but uh, maybe barley wine. But generally, uh, I'll go into two schools. Like if I'm fortunate enough, maybe I'm traveling to a new city in a, in a perfect world or going to a new bar, I will. I'll untapped nerd myself out. I'm going to pull out my phone. And what I look for are two things. I want to find a beer that I haven't had before because there's enough of them where one of my favorite things is to try that new beer. Usually I'll try and stick with the style this summer uh, and hopefully for the rest of my life, it's lagers. And so I'm going to look for a lager and I'm going to compare it to the last couple I had and try and figure if there's anything that stands out to me and, and use that to build a memory. But if I'm really fortunate and I'm sharing a beer, that's my favorite thing to do is look back on some of the beers that I've had that I've really enjoyed um, like Duchess. If anybody's had Duchess, it's somewhat unassuming, but the first time you have that beer, it's just, it's magical. And I love when I know I'm going to have friends over or going to be sharing beer. Those are the beers that I want to go back and look for the ones that just really made an impact with me. And I want to share it with people and yeah, try and nerd out, you know, smell it and then think about the first memory that comes to mind when you taste it. But Two different schools of thought. If I'm sharing beers, I'm going for my like my my standby go-to favorite beers. And if I'm drinking by myself, I'm going the other direction where it's things I've never tried before. Now, John, I have two follow-up questions for you on that one. First off, you mentioned Duchess. I was informed last week that you can now purchase Duchess in both bottles, of course, but also cans. Have you experienced Duchess in a can yet? I haven't, but I think I just got a new reason to drink it. Uh <laughs> and second, you know, your podcast is called Drinking Socially, but also you mentioned that you are so into this, well, untapped, of course. So how do you balance between, let's say, drinking socially, but also the data side of experiencing a beer? If, if I can take a like a cop out answer, the thing that I like about Untapped and the rating system, it's I don't know if there is an infallible rating system. Um, maybe the movie board got it right. No, they didn't. Um, but what I like about Untapped is you've got uh, one beer. Maybe it's only released in North Carolina. Maybe it's East Coast. Maybe it's nationwide. But generally, there's so many data points that you know, the super fans that give it an instant perfect score and then the trolls that give it an instant terrible score, there's enough data points where they kind of wash out. And I generally like to find some kind of happy medium of the 50,000 reviews. I feel like I get a good story from that to make a decision. But if I can be honest, the most important ratings are the ones from like my untapped friends that I know that I trust, or even if we can live in, in 1990 again, when a real friend comes up to me in real life and says, hey, you should try this beer. It's really good. If I trust him, yes. If it's my father-in-law, no, because his recommendation is Bud Light. But generally, I like, I like to weigh the reviews based on who's providing them. No, that's great feedback there. Jean with Esther, you know, I'm very curious in your process that you go through. I feel like if I was hanging out for you, we would enjoy three sips of a beer over the course of like an hour. Then you'd input it in your database. We'd look at how it compares to everything and then we'd enjoy the rest. But, you know, in real life, how would that experience be to enjoy a beer in your world? Oh, you're muted. Sorry. The The goal is that we, uh, that we don't have to do that anymore because we have done it already, of course. But um, I, I think like I, I always have a tension between two, uh, two sides of it. One is indeed, and I follow a, a bunch of the things that Jacob said, like I look at the occasion and what I'm, what I'm, uh, when I'm drinking, but definitely also like any kind of, uh, link that I can find with a previous experience. Um, so I look for a label that I recognize, a name that I recognize, even a style that I recognize and that I know that I like. Um, and then I, I look at all the, <laughs> from a flavor perspective, all the wrong things, right? So I look at uh, pretty labels and I mean, my wife will tell me like, you, we should have this because the label is nice. 
Um, and, and definitely also look at price. Um, that's also a factor. So all these things kind of uh, come into play. Come into play. Um, I'm getting um, some. I'm getting some. Oh, you have that too. You have that too. No. Okay. Um, and so the the tension is with the other side, where what I want to be my aspiration is that I can just say to a bartender or to a store associate, like, surprise me uh, and uh, tell me what I should taste, and I will follow your advice because you know better. Um, and the the reason why I don't do that all the time is that. I probably don't know if they know my flavor specifically enough. So, so that's always like, it's, it becomes too risky. So I'm always looking for some kind of de-risking of the process, but at the same time, trying to explore and to experience new products. And John, you bring up an interesting point midway through your example there. It would have been interesting to have someone in the branding world in this conversation to hear about the impact of art and label design. So I think that's just another approach to how we, for lack of a better way to put it, approach beer selection and tasting. So that's a very interesting point there. Yeah. But could you explain a little bit about what Esther exactly does for a brewery? Yeah, so uh, basically, if, if you look at it from a, from a brewery perspective, what we want to do is a, is a source of data, a source of insights, right? So um, what we try to do in the, in the back end, uh, in our platform, in our technology, is really gather as many data points as we can find about a beer. And that means um, everything we can know about the product, including, for example, a, a visual analysis of the label, looking at, looking at consumer reviews, for example. But then we add our own sensory analysis and our own chemical analysis into the mix. And, and we really want to create that, that full fingerprint of the product and what we call the single source of truth for that product, right? Um, but then that, that's, that's a value for a producer already. But to us, the, the big difference or the big, the big reason to work with us is how we make that information available. And so what we want to do is give any craft brewer out there the chance to not only look at their data, but to, to be able to compare that data to other products in the market um, and, and look at where they stand, look at the competition, look at what everybody's doing, look at new products that are popping up. And even on top of that, finding information and finding insights on what consumers are looking for. And so I always talk about sensory in, on the one hand, the technical sensory that we do in the brewery and, and that the, the train panels do, but then the consumer also continuously does a sensory analysis and they take into account other factors like label and price and marketing and branding and word of mouth and, and what their friends and family tell them. And we want to to gather those insights as well and share them with craft brewers. No, fantastic. And Laura, did you ever think you'd be on a panel with someone talking about all that in-depth data with regards to tasting a beer? No, um, but my my background in higher education was artificial intelligence. So that's an interesting crossover. Of course, that was pre-internet, so um, a lot of the principles remain, but who knows about the rest of the pieces. Um, so much of what I learned is, is kind of gone by the wayside at this point. Um, but for me, I wanted to um, just throw out there that I have um, learned and taught and guided so many people through the Cicerone programs that that has changed the way that I enjoy a beverage, whether it's socially or whether it's um, deliberately. And so um, it's interesting to kind of see how my perception has changed over time in general. And I'm also one to ask um, whether it's the, the liquor store buyer or whether it's the bartender, what's new, what they would suggest, um, and, and adventuresome. Uh, so I don't really have a particular um, go-to and I don't always go to favorites. Um, but it's interesting to um, to think about how I used to experience beverage in general and how I do today. That's very interesting. And it comes up full circle for you, talking about, you know, artificial intelligence today and with regard to just the overall tasting experience. So I'm glad both of you are here. Now, with regard to the actual tasting, how much do, 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 ounce, how many ounces do each of you recommend to get a proper tasting of a beer? 
<laughs> is, is it pounding it as quickly as you can, John? Is that the best approach? One sip, one gulp, sure. Um, no, I don't think I have a good answer here. I, I, I'm gonna, I'll start by just saying, if you if you get less than two, I don't know if you've had a chance to really get that. Uh, what are the retro nasal? If you've had a chance to really absorb it all, so I would I would start the bidding at, at greater than two ounces. But hopefully, you guys have a more educated backing of that. Unless you're at big beers at altitude, <laughs> that then then you sample carefully smaller. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I would add to that. I, I think it depends on what kind of sensory analysis you're trying to do, right? For for a technical sensory analysis and a description of the beer, um, I, I think it really depends on your method. And I see different tasters have different methods. Some take one sip and then they write a whole, like they write a, out a whole form. Others need to take two or three sips or let give it some time. And, and so everybody has their own method there. Um, what I also see is that a lot of consumers are tasting beers and they want to taste the beer. They want to experience the beer. And so then it becomes, you know, is it as a small glass as a flight or is it just a full beer and you want to experience the actual beer? We, we say that whatever you need, uh, is what you should drink. And Jacob, how about at White Labs? What's the approach you like to take? Yeah, I was going to say that, um, you know, for we do like aroma trials for sensory and things like that. We'll, we'll compare different yeast strains in the same, uh, you know, single malt, uncarbonated uh, recipe. We'll do like different fermentation temperatures, different pitching rates. And for those samples, I don't need very much because I'm not going to be tasting it really. It, it doesn't taste great. Uh, you're really just looking for ester and phenol characters from the yeast um, or attenuation rates or something like that. So for those very little, but uh, so that's going into the, the statement of, you know, it depends on the situation, right? Um, but for for others, you know, panels or um, for, for customers, I, was, I always go with four ounces. It's just what we what we sell. It's it's enough for me to really evaluate the sample fully. Um, so, yeah, just depends, I guess. And I think we're all talking about evaluating beers. We just do it in different ways. And it's interesting to think about because, Jean, you're doing such a high le level analysis that's giving like personalized flavor recommendations. And, John, with Untapped, you're almost doing the crowdsource data. Then, Jacob and Laura, it's more that sensory data that we're putting into the picture. You know, for the overall consumer experience, should they be relying on all avenues? And more importantly, where does each of your unique data sets fall in the process. Like for example, like John with untapped, I mean, a lot of people will be checking that untapped to see the scores prior to even, you know, picking which beer they're going to buy from the store. They're already looking at that data. And John with Esther, I imagine the data that you provide has a lot of value after the fact for not necessarily the consumer, but maybe the brewer, maybe the retailer and things like that. But Laura and Jacob, I would imagine a lot of what you experience with the sensory data is while you're actually enjoying the beer. I would love for any of you to kind of just speak on the fact of your unique approach, whether it's more so analytical with regard to the data or just you know being in the moment with the sensory. What are your thoughts on what's the most valuable aspect to judge when experiencing a beer? Well, I can jump in on that one. I think that um, on, a, on a purely consumer driven basis, I think untapped often gets us to a place, but in order to completely experience that brewery, it's more a flight. It's more try all of the things and find out if there's something hidden in there. Um, some gem that you love that maybe the rest of the planet didn't um, to get a full um, snapshot, I guess, if you will, of, of the different facets of who that brewer is, what that brewery stands for, that full experience. So I think that we tend to use the, the data points to to direct us if there's a billion choices. But um, once we get there, it's it's not about, I mean, maybe you enter your preferences at the end of the day or the end of the visit, but it's it's about experiencing it personally from more perspectives than just that single beer. Laura, you mentioned ratings and like with, with Untapped. Do you believe since systems like Untapped have come into play 
that the consumer is better to find what they enjoy quicker? And do you think that's valuable for the industry? Uh, I don't know. I think that depends on your type of drinker. I mean, I love the line, it depends, but um, <laughs> there, there are people who are obsessively looking for the beers that have the rating. And that's what they're, they're all about. We have to go to this brewery and have this beer um, and, and I, you know, there are a lot of those in my world. I run homebrew competitions and, you know, that a lot of the people that are purely untapped driven are there. Um, that's, that's where they find the hidden gems and they trust other people to find it for them. Um, but more often than not, I find that it's more of a, a general direction rather than a specific mission. Um, and I forget what the question was because I was wondering. So get me back on track. No, you did great. That was fantastic. I'd like to turn it over to John with Untapped on this one. You know, what are your thoughts on all of this? It's I, I I respect Laura's approach, and I don't I don't think it's wrong. I don't think there are right or wrong answers here, which makes me more comfortable speaking off the cuff. But um, what I what I've grown to like. So when I started falling in love with craft beer, it was easy. Everything was brand new. Oh my gosh, what's uh, what's this German beer? Everything was new and incredible and amazing. And if you're an obsessive person like me, you chew through that. Everything that's available locally has been consumed within a year and you're starting to look for these new opportunities and new beers. And early on, it would be Facebook or Instagram or a group of friends that would kind of share that, you know, they're doing a limited release of this 22 ounce back when they were cool. And what I really have grown to appreciate Untapped for as a consumer, the rating's nice. I'll admit, like Hetty Topper, Untapped drove me to to pursue that that beer. And as I've evolved, I've learned that you know I was a Hetty Topper fan, not an Alchemist fan. And Untapped does a really good job of driving you to the beer. But as a consumer, I think you do yourself a disservice if you only grab that one icon and you don't taste their lager or you maybe miss out on a really cool smoked beer that you never would have tried so um that part of untapped is is gray we'll say but what's as an old guy what i really like now is that uh from technology untapped will allow me to flag beers that i'm going to be interested in or you know when does this seasonal beer come out again uh when can i get trogues nugget nectar for example and what I like are some of the shops and bottle shops and breweries that work with me in my area or that work with Untapped. If they update their beer menu on Untapped, I'll get a notification. Boom, John, this beer you wanted is available. And as an old guy, I love that. Uh, um, it, it just makes it easy for me to go get that beer. But to Laura's point, I think it is. It's directing people to a specific beer, not to the whole experience. It's up to you to appreciate everything once you get there. And with regard to ease for finding beers, like you mentioned, it is fantastic when you get a notification on your phone saying one of your favorite beers is available two miles from your house. You know, the ultimate goal that we all share is the growth of craft beer and making, you know, more consumers able to find what they enjoy most. So I think that feature of Untapped is absolutely fantastic because it's allowing for the consumer to find what they want a little bit easier, which is putting more dollars into the craft beer economy. Now, Jean over at Esther, I, I would love to hear a little bit more about, you know, your data approach and, you know, how you feel with regard to, you know, a lot of the sensory that Laura talks about, because it's very similar to what you do, but you're doing the all on analysis. And, you know, while you touch on this, what are some of the data points that you have found most valuable to brewers that you've experienced? Yeah, so... It's 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 a, such an interesting problem eh? because everyone around uh, the table here, the virtual table, is is looking at the same problem. It's like deciphering, understanding flavor and flavor experience. And and to me, one of the key elements and one of the reasons that we went into this is that flavor is so incredibly complex and so individual. It depends on you know circumstances, emotions. Uh, it's it's not rational or not fully rational. And so that means that if you are going to use data to try and understand it, uh, at best, you're going to get some weak signals, which makes it a very, very interesting technology problem, actually, and an AI problem. Now, 
if you want to look at it from a from a personalization way and you want to give people recommendations that are especially made for them you need at least to look at the data from two perspectives which is you need to look at the product data and you need to look at the consumer data and i think what untapped does so amazingly is look at that consumer side of it and and what John said before is like being able to kind of capture your experiences, uh, log what you've been drinking, make tasting notes, rate beers, etc. I think is incredibly valuable, and it's a source of data that he can he can know that I'm very jealous of, right? Um, on the other side, you have that product data, right? And and product product data includes everything you can know, as I said before. So. It includes sensory analysis. And I think, again, like, like the work that Laura does and, and White Labs does as well is, is incredibly valuable on that side, trying to understand the, the product itself. And to us, the, the big question, like the, the, big, uh, the big challenge is how do you connect those two, right? So because in the end, and that's the last thing I want to say about that, in the end, if you want to understand personal flavor preference, you have to understand language as well. And, and every consumer has their own way of talking about, about flavor as well. And so connecting those two data sets allows you to listen to a consumer saying, oh, I like the sweetness of this beer, and then translating it into, wait, but in the sensory analysis, is it sweet or is it actually fruity, right? Or you can look into chemistry and see esters instead of, instead of sugar. And so you can then tell that consumer, either tell them like, hey, just so you know, you don't mean sweet, you mean fruity, um, or just listen to them and speak their language. And, and that's what we're trying to do is, is really connect those data sets to give those recommendations. John, I'd love to hear some use cases of how brewers or retailers are actually using the data that you provide. Yeah, I'll, I'll, um, I mean, the most, one of the most exciting examples is uh, what we're building for Craft Beer Cellar. And, and it's not live yet, but uh, we're hoping to launch that in, in July, where Craft Beer Cellar has, has an amazing assortment of, you know, hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of, of beers and craft beers. Um, but if you have your sellers or retailer with locations all, all across the country. Correct. Yeah. They're like, uh, they have like 20 stores and, and we're working with their team out in Boston. Um, and so basically you get into a store like that, or even worse, you get on a website like that as a consumer and it's kind of impossible to find something. Um, at best, there is a filter that leads you through location or leads you through certain styles or certain price points, for example, uh, but that's about it. And, and what we wanted to do is um, help a consumer you know, find their way, be guided through that assortment and actually use questions, use conversations to, to gather information about that customer but then use that information to guide them to the beer that they are absolutely going to love in an incredibly personalized way. So, so that's what we do there. And then what happens in that process is that we gather data about a lot of those products in the assortments, but also about those consumers. And that data is what we basically give back to the, the brewing community and the craft industry, which, which helps them tremendously in analyzing the market, looking at you know, where, where specific white spaces may be opportunities for new product development, uh, give them insights on how to launch something and how they should brand something, how to what audience they should market a certain flavor or a certain beer. And that's what we're after, right? It's, it's to create that, that flavor intelligence um, and, then, and then bring that flavor intelligence to the craft brewers uh, that can use it. And John, have you ever thought of adding a consumer facing side to the Esther model? So at this point, I mean, we, we know that uh, there is, you know, untapped for beer. There is there is Vivino for wine. I mean, in my perfect world, we would all work together and, and build this together. But um, we also see that there is a lot of demand from from retailers and brewers that want to do direct to consumer that are looking into ways to kind of engage their consumer both online and offline. Um, and there's a tremendous need for this kind of technology for those players. So up until now, we've always said, like, instead of trying to compete with, with um, a company like Untapped or, or Vivino, 
you know, we want to make sure that retailers have access to similar technology, to, to similar data, so that they can provide a service to their consumer at the moment that that consumer needs it. And John, one of my favorite things about recommendations in general is like when I'm reading like a music magazine, say it's Rolling Stone or some music blog, there's always like a recommended if you like. If you're listening to this artist, then you might like this something. I feel just those personalized recommendations, even something as basic as that, are extremely valuable to the consumer. Now, untapped, John, you know, there's so much data that is in that untapped whole ecosystem. Is there a way in the app to, you know, put like flavor preferences that I might have and receive recommendations on beers you may enjoy? I think we're halfway to that point, but uh, like you can tag when you check into a beer, this was fruity, this was hoppy, et cetera, et cetera. But mm -hmm. there's not a way to then use that data in reverse. And if, if, if jealousy is 50, 50, uh, Jean from Esther. Yep. I, I am jealous of the way you guys are using that information. Cause I think it would really help drive untapped recommendations. No, very cool. Now, Jacob over at White Labs, you're up. I mean, we've kind of gone a little off the original topic, but I would love for you to talk a little bit just about what you're doing with different varieties of yeast and putting the side by side yeast with the same beer based recipe side by side. How is that experience for the consumer? Yeah, I, I listening to everyone speak so far, I've been really excited to kind of give my input because everything you guys have been saying is is a lot of what I'm dealing with on a much smaller scale. Um, definitely less probably statistically accurate than Esther, but we're trying to like we're all we're all doing. We're trying to compile that and, and make it very clear what we're tasting, which is always something that you know I think mm -hmm. in the industry we're ch we're chasing after that. But I deal with um, you know every every side of the data from trying to please the the cons the customer in our tap room and, and and see what they're liking and what they're tasting. Um, we're trying. We're also trying to get their sensory analysis on these yeast strains in these different beers um, through different applications. But then I'm also, you know, we're trying to evaluate shelf life, and we're we're evaluating our beers from a very like a brewery perspective, um, making sure that the beer on is tasting great, brand development, uh, true to target, all these things. We're now we're trying to do analysis on as well. And then you go one step farther, and from from an ingredient supplier, you're trying to perform analysis on on what you're selling and make sure that you can communicate that to the home brewer or the professional brewer, make sure that they know how the uh, product is going to behave, what it's going to produce. And so sometimes, you know, I, I, it, it, it's, it's awesome. At the same time though, you know, you gotta change your lens when you're looking at these three perspectives. And so, you know, everything that, um, that you guys have been talking about this whole time, I, I feel, you know, I can connect with in some different way, whichever, whichever Avenue, um, you know, I'm looking at at one time. Um, so, you know, can you, uh, follow me up with another question? Sorry. I feel like that was, that was kind of what I was wanting to say that whole time. And then I kind of forgot the question. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. I'd like you to touch on a little bit more. What's the experience like for the guest who comes to one of the white lab tasting rooms and you put the same beer side by side, but it has different yeast strains. Like how are you educating the consumer on the best ways to appreciate that? Right. Yeah. Sorry. Total, totally blanked on that. Yeah. So we are, you know, we're doing 10 barrels of wort when we make a beer for, for our tasting rooms and we're splitting it into two five barrel fermenters and just pitching a different yeast strain. Um, we will tailor the fermentation profile to that strain because we do sometimes do ale versus lager yeast or, um, you know, pretty, pretty different strains. And, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to ferment a lager strain at 20 Celsius or something like that. Not, I mean, not always. So, we do tailor it a little bit and then we'll serve it to you in two four ounce tasters. The way we describe it as you walk in is, you know, we have the same beer side by side, all the variables, or there's only one variable, it's experiment. Um, and the yeast is, is what you're going to be receiving. And so we set it down to them. So I'd be like, you know, this is, this is zero, zero, one, this is zero, zero, eight. Um, they would take it and, and, you know, we can walk through it together. That's the cool thing about working in the tasting room um at white lobs is it's very you know as a as a beer tender behind the bar we we uh we call them education ambassadors because it takes a level of of uh knowledge and a level of communication that i i think is is you know you have to have that in order to speak on beer process beer ingredients esters phenols attenuation all these characters from the fermentation and really describe what the difference is to the customer because they, they're curious whether they're you know you know 
whether they're just a beer taster and they like drinking and they go into you know different breweries and they just happen to walk in or whether they're the average home brewer that's really looking for something new to try or experiment with you have to speak to all those different levels and um, so we try to we try to really make it a, a fun conversation for the customer when they come in if they have questions we love answering those questions i mean i'll I love talking about beer. We love talking about beer, so I welcome it, you know, always. And uh, and we want them to leave thinking, you know, really realizing that, wow, this is this is so impactful. This is an aspect of of beer that I've never really thought of. This was a great experience, um, and, and hopefully that that continues to grow. Home brewing, the beer industry. I mean, that's our end goal. We were founded on home brewing, and um, and we, we really want to just keep that growing. It's a very uh, community based tap room where, where we're really trying to offer any kind of educational initiative or event that we can to continue growing the industry. I want to jump just for one second. I love that you're talking about conversation eh? because that's, that's in my opinion is how you educate, but also how you understand uh, flavor preference. It's all through conversation. So I think that's super impressive, Jacob. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the best part about it for sure is, it, you know, seeing people light up with that aha, mo aha moment, that's, you know, you go home satisfied. It, you know, it's just beer, but at the same time, you know, you're teaching someone something and that's so satisfying because I know how I felt when I first learned that when I was first shown this, you know, I was, my mind was blown and to, to have people have that same experience is, 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 is so cool. And, um, and when they can, when they can, you know, maybe they'll say, I don't, I don't like IPAs. You know, we hear that all the time, or I don't like this style, uh, but then you serve it to them and there's two different strains. They may prefer one strain with that style and it's a newfound thing for them. And, and that's, that's awesome. That's what, so we all want to see. So um, yeah, the conversation is everything. I was um, just thinking of, of a lot of the staff training that I've done in, in some of the restaurants that I've curated the, the programs for and thinking about the number of times that people's heads get in the way. Um, mm -hmm. We would get to the point where we would be tasting the beers on the list, mm -hmm. um, retasting, familiarizing, talking about what you're experiencing so that you can explain it to the guest. And I would have to start doing blind tastings for some of the beers in order for them to get out of their heads and taste without the prejudice in the way. And even for something as normal as Sierra Nevada Pale or Fat Tire, they had just um, become, I guess, jaded um, at that point because it's always been on our list. And I would have to, to literally do a blind tasting in order for them to be able to appreciate what those beers are um, because like, like you were saying, I don't like IPAs or, you know, there's, there's this, uh, there's this piece that gets, I don't like beer was one, you know, since I'm so consumer facing with these programs, um, do you like chocolate? Do you like, um, a particular fruit? Do you like, you know, there's other flavors that we can pull in to your point with the, with the IPAs and the yeast, you know, when you get somebody, when you get them to engage their brain there's a whole lot of room there for learning and exploring that they might've previously shut off. It's just really interesting to uh, watch and learn from the consumer behavior. Mm -hmm. Laura, you bring up a lot of really great points. One follow-up Jacob, I was going to give you when I think about, you know, the white labs experience you're talking about comparing yeast strains, I'm thinking about that home brewer. I'm thinking about the beer nerd that's behind the bar, you know, asking you all these questions. But what's the customer persona like at your tap rooms? Are you getting just the general person who goes to a brewery or are you getting more so that beer nerd type character who's interested in all the, the hard questions you like to talk about? Yeah, I would say, you know, majority of people coming in are definitely, um, you know, pretty well educated in, in on beer or in the industry they're, they're they follow it pretty closely or they home brew or they have some aspect of that but we also do get a lot of people that you know just google breweries near me and they're coming down the highway and they pop in and it's uh you know at, you have to really be able to like i said you have to be able to change your communication because they come in and the first thing we always ask them is uh, have you been in before it's a very important question because if you haven't been in before, we, we offer a unique experience. You're going to have no idea what's going on looking at our menu where it's a beer style and then these these product names for yeast underneath of it. Um, it's very it can also be intimidating. So we got to really break it down and, and make it not so intense. You know, sensory to uh, to a lot of people that aren't trained in it. 
um, it's extre extremely, um, you know, intimidating. I, I know I was intimidated when I first came in. You know, people asking me what you taste. You don't, you don't know exactly what you're tasting, so you don't know what to say. And when we say that we're going to taste things side by side, they're like, "Oh, I just want to drink a beer sometimes." So, um, so yeah, I would, <laughs> you know, you really got to cater that and th and see where they're at with it, and then um, and and then proceed from there. So. I would say maybe two thirds, some level of, of like, you know, they knew White Labs coming in, they're coming here for a reason, um, whether they humber, whether they, uh, you know, follow the industry closely or not. And then maybe a third that's, as people just kind of trickling in from, from the, from San Diego that just want to try something different. Very cool. Thanks for sharing that. And just yep. talking about sensory as a whole, and this is for anyone who wants to throw out an answer. When we're educating a brand new consumer and craft beer right now, let's say we've got about 13% of the beer sales by volume in our country right now, but we obviously want to grow that number. When you're trying to talk to the brand new person who's discovering craft beer, what's the ter what are the terminologies you want to make sure you're educating them on? Are there like those three favorite keywords you want to throw their way that if they left White Labs that day, they've learned this, this, and this? What are the key points you use to get that entry-level drinker more into craft and more so into enjoying and understanding the tasting experience? Is that a question for me or everyone? Anyone who wants to take that one. That's a tough one, thinking about it. Yeah. Well, Laura, I'm going to throw it your way because you've been educating for so long. You know, if you have that brand new customer who you're engaging with, if they had three key takeaways from you, I mean, whether it's just the word something as simple as aroma or mouthfeel or just what hops are, what are the key takeaways you'd want someone to say, I learned this from Laura today, if they're just a brand new beer consumer? Um, I think, I think the idea that beer is food and that you can pull it back to so many of the different flavor components and aroma components of food, beer is food would be one. Another would be that your experience is so driven by aromatics. Um, I think that that's such an important part of what we experience. And, you know, back to it depends, but I think another one that, that I, I use a lot is the, the bitterness component. Um, I will find out from people if they like coffee. Um, it, it, the, the hops and the bitterness team seem to be such a pivotal element of enjoying a beer. I'm not a hoppy person. I'm not. I'm not a fan of bitter, um, and and so I've discovered that sour can get people around that, or just simply not hoppy beers. So I think the third, if I if if you're limiting me to three, I think my third one would be that understanding of the the bitterness slash hops component and how to work around it or embrace it. Awesome. Three great points there. Yeah, I piggybacking off that, I I totally agree with those. You know when we, I, I do a lot of sensory related uh, classes to the public uh, here in San Diego, you know, sh small 20, 30 uh, person events. And the three things I always say when the, the presentation is over is, you know, um, like always have fun with wh whenever you're, you're smelling or tasting something, it's not, don't ever take it too seriously. Um, Cause all these people are coming in and they've never attended something like this. Um, I, I always emphasize like textures, something that people I think with the liquids don't think about too much, but you know, so much like faucets alone can change the texture of the beer, um, you know, carbonation wise and things like that. It's like, it's like really pay attention to that because that can change your entire experience. You know, something on a nitro, a nitro or a side pull faucet versus a traditional faucet can completely change that. And that's, that's a really exciting thing to think about or to, to pay attention to when you're tasting is just how's that feel on your palate. And then, um, and then, yeah, the, uh, oh shoot, what was the other thing? Uh, when you're talking about, uh, you know, I, I always say when you're, uh, in your daily life, you know, when you're eating and things like that, really pay attention to this, like the seasonings, the spices, the the different components of a meal, like just for a second, you know, think about what's in that. Cause that will then translate a lot into, into fermented beverages, like liquid products, beer in general. And that's really exciting for that new drinker. Cause I, I never really perceived food or drinks that way before, beer, before getting in the industry and, and learning more. I never really thought about what I was, was eating, what seasoning was on it, things like that. So that's, I think that's a big eye opener to that, that new drinker. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
I, I want to add one thing to that. And, and my, my view is that it depends, obviously. Um, and, and to me, there's like something to first know before you start thinking about educating something. And, and so it's, you have to know what a consumer already knows, uh, how educated they are and then how, uh, what their willingness to learn is, right? And I, I've seen so many people that are not interested in learning and they know a little bit and they are just there to enjoy a beer. And so the education you can do is to put in front of them beers that they'll enjoy and that's about it. And you don't have to explain anything. But then there's people that are really eager in, in trying to figure out what they like and, and why they like something and there you can, I mean, my, my thing would be, can you teach them what they are sensitive to, right? I, I always take the example of bitterness. I know people that, that are so sensitive to bitterness and other people that basically don't taste it or don't smell it even, or, or like they don't perceive it. And, and so you have to kind of adapt what you emphasize to that. And, and to me, educating and teaching is all about um, helping someone uh, find the things that they are sensitive to, whatever those are. I, as a, maybe, maybe as a nerd myself, I totally like, I, I love Jacob and Laura where you guys went with that. But John, as soon as you started talking, um, I immediately like the point I wanted to make, I have a background in sales. And one of the most important things is to ask questions and for me, my probably the most rewarding part of my beer career, I was working at a grocery store and we were able to have some beers on tap and we had this giant beer aisle and people would come in all the time. Oh, do you have something from Hill Farmstead or do you have cases of Bud Light and all variety of customer? And the ones that became like a fan of me, the ones that would come back and say, hey, John, what else do you have? It was because we'd have a question and answer like, okay, well, tell me about the beer you love most or tell me about a beer that you hate and being able to kind of work through that with them. Some of the, the high points of my entire career were getting people to enjoy stouts or getting people to take a step into pale ales and eventually become part of the IPA crowd. But just encouraging people to experiment. That's probably uh, like Jacob said, like keep an open mind, have fun. And if you don't like it today, you know, try it again in five months, just like black coffee. Most of us didn't enjoy it our first time, but after a while it's really comfortable. So keep an open mind. And if I had any advice for a person new to craft beer, it would be use untapped and keep notes or use a notepad, but keep track of, uh, you know, what you like and what you didn't like. Cause it's, using untapped, it's really easy and cool to see sour beers uh, are something that I study pretty frequently. And you can see everybody's trend where it's like really low ratings, really low ratings. And then there's a little bump where they finally found one that they liked. Maybe it was a ghost. Maybe it was a really like fruited Berlin or something like that introductory period. And then from that point, the ratings go way up on the sour scale. Like once they find that one beer that they enjoy and, and that's awesome. I love seeing that and sharing that with people when I can. And to speak to John and John, John with Esther, I know you use the terminology personalized flavor recommendations a lot, but John at untapped, it seems like when you were working in the grocery store, you were doing the exact same thing. So no matter how you're looking at, the unique data set you have, it's all about those personalized flavor recommendation. And it's so funny when we're having a conversation today that's almost half about data, it still comes down to that human interaction component and that conversational aspect of just getting to know the person on the other side of the bar or getting to know yourself and finding what you enjoy. Because drinking beer is a social, it's a social activity and it's that conversation we're gonna have with one another that's going to help you find the right occasion to drink what you enjoy the most. And we've talked a lot over the past almost hour now about, you know, how we can best find the right beer for the consumer. But on the other side of the bar, back to the brewery side of the bar, it's really important that those working in a brewery and those in the industry, you know, can best understand the beers as well. What are some of the professional tools you four have found that are really valuable for training staff to better understand and appreciate beer? Um, I, I would say, and, and this popped into my head when, when John was talking to you, um, creating a safe space 
a neutral space, a space where each individual opinion is uh, validated and, and where people are comfortable experiencing their own truth is an interesting uh, challenge in some cases and 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 maybe is you know is is the importance and value of what Jean is doing in terms of having that objective um, you, you, when people's heads don't get in the way and they don't need to experience the thing that their neighbor is experiencing or their friend is experiencing or what they feel like they're supposed to be experiencing, I think you get a much cleaner um, experience or launch pad to start from. And I think um, Jacob probably runs into that too, where all of a sudden the, the aha often comes from my, what I'm experiencing is okay. It's valid. It's important. Um, and, and to John's sales experience too, once, once the consumer feels heard, um, all of a sudden uh, the world opens up and, and they are so much happier and more comfortable with, with visiting about their experience. I think it's an interesting space to create that safe space, that validated space. And I think when people feel comfortable experiencing and learning about themselves, we get to a better space. I did yeah. see a comment about glassware. And I wanted to say that I, I, we're assuming safe spaces. We're assuming proper glassware. We're assuming clean draft lines. We're assuming all sorts of things when we're talking about objective evaluation of our experience. Um, and I think that that's a good thing to note as well. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I just want to jump on what Laura said. Uh, the, to me, the, the key element to professionally to, to be able to do everything you do is to have access to that, what we call a single source of truth, right? To have, to have that as objective as possible, whether that's sensory or chemical or a combination of all of the above, um, uh, you know, description or description product. And the minute you have that, um, you can do amazing things. You can really, you know, help a consumer. And up until now, that single source of truth mostly has been uh, a bartender or a store associate or for wine a sommelier. And, you know, we're hoping to add to that. That's uh, to contribute to that. Yeah, I was going to say that, um, you know, speaking on training staff and and within the the company i, I we you know we give onboarding and we do lectures on sensory or um with different staff lectures on on yeast attributes and things like that but i found that when i've really been able to connect with one of our staff and we've really you know had the aha moment or i felt like i walked away and we, we both learned something or I learned something it's always been one-on-one -on -one conversations we keep talking about conversations and communication and and it's when it's when it's when it's not in a lecture setting when it's more intimate than that and there's not that pressure and it is just okay and we're just chatting and we're back in the brew house pouring a sample off and uh, and someone says do you get this and then you, you you're like oh yeah something like that and then we can go look at the data and have that confirm what we just said because that's the cool thing about working at white labs we test everything so we can always see you know where's the data at for for this uh for what we're perceiving and things like that um that's those have been the most in influential uh training moments i would say and so i i really try to like walk around and always daily speak with different people i mean obviously the pandemic's put a little hinder on that but you know now starting back up we can really have those those conversations again and 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 you know maybe that person you know had never perceived a certain flavor compound or off flavor or something like that and then we can have that that just one-on-one -on -one chat about you know i saw the data came back with this and i'm smelling this and and that's usually the bet i found the best way because that's that people don't forget those those conversations they'll forget what you say in a 45 minute lecture on five different things but it's always um those one-on-ones they might even forget what you say in a 45 second lecture as i've experienced many times <laughs> before um, but I, 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 if I had anything to chime in, it would just be agreeing with you. I love Laura's idea of a blind taste test from earlier to eliminate any of that kind of like pre-judgment, pre-prejudice you might have when you see a beer. Um, and I like the idea of taking notes. I think it's important to reference your own growth. But also, like Jacob was saying, like don't do this in a vacuum, whether you're doing it exclusively digitally on untapped or in a notebook or, you know, like make sure you share these thoughts with other people, whether they're professional qualified or just casual beer drinking friends. Cause that to your point, Andrew, that social side is really important. Some of the best beer tastings I've had 
began not because of something I found in a beer, but because you hear someone else say like, oh, I'm grassy, you know, and then you have another sip and you go down this whole journey. I love doing that and, and stealing other people's thoughts or, or, or perceptions of about a beer and including them in my own tasting and keep doing it. Don't, don't do it once and consider yourself an expert. Do it every Thursday. John, one of my local, one of my, I do do it every Thursday. I have a standing date at four o'clock every Thursday. I meet up with a group of people outside and we try beers together. So yes, do it every Thursday. That's a great idea. But when you said grassy, it made me think of a local beer bar who leaves great tasting notes on their menu. And one of my favorite terms to describe a beer is possibly horse blanket. Horse blanket has become one of my favorite terms over the past year but look on that past year past drinking years of my career but you know looking at the conversation we've had today whether we're talking about sensory data or anything in between i think one big takeaway is laura said it best it depends that there's not a perfect approach to tasting and enjoying a beer whether you're just a drinker on one side of the brewery bar or you're on the other side serving it there's no right approach and i think the more tools we have in our toolkit the better we can understand the beverage in front of us and appreciate it even more and then you know just educating others about that beer in front of them we can just help with the growth of craft beer and laura you got something you'd like to add um, I just, I really think that the more we continue that conversation, whether it's with staff or whether it's with guests or whether it's with the brewers, um, every every time we have the opportunity to feedback all the way through the chain um, and, and more information we have to what Jean is building, uh, the better off we are. And I think it was Jacob that said communication, communication, communication. I mean, I really think that that that's what it comes down to. We need to be comfortable with our own truth, but we also need to communicate that. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. And I think as the craft beer industry continues to grow, the four of you are definitely leading the way in providing valuable in information and education to both the consumer, but also the brewery professional as well. So I appreciate the four of you joining today. Jacob, John, Jean, and Laura, this has always been a good time. We could probably talk for hours more about what we've discussed today. So I thank you for hanging out with me today. Looking forward to sharing a beer in person, hopefully in the not too distant future. So cheers and we'll see you soon. Talk soon. Thank, Thank you. you. Cheers. Cheers.